attractive breeding programs appear like a straightforward solution to the management of endangered species. Examples of these programs are frequently publicised with organisations such as zoos advertising their breeding programmes as their positive contributions to conservation. But how effective are these programmes really? And what is captive breeding? In their wild environment, animals may still be subject to the pressures that cause the species to decline in the first place. This could be ecological changes like the weather, prey availability, or human influences such as habitat encroachment. It may also be difficult in the case of some species to actually monitor their numbers safely and effectively, whilst also limiting the disturbance of natural behaviour. As a response to these problems, captive breeding can be a useful conservation tool. Establishing a backup population of animals ensures the survival of the species in the short term by removing the additional threats to mortality they would face in the wild, while having the added benefit of easier monitoring of individuals. With advances of veterinary medicine, techniques such as artificial insemination can improve breeding success, and the appearance of individuals generally controlled ensure a genetically healthy next generation. However, captive breeding programs are expensive and the rate of success of reintroduction is low. Animals bred in captivity have very different lifestyles than those in the wild and may not be able to cope with the stressors of the wild that their counterparts experience daily. Some recent studies have observed that the phenotype of captive and wild populations of the same species vary, but if the phenotype of the captive individual diverges enough over generations, would that individual still be seen as a desirable mate by a wild individual? This could result in assortative mate choice within the species. Assortative mate choice is when animals will tend to mate with other individuals with a similar phenotype. As captive breeding is central to the recovery of threatened species, it is important to determine whether these phenotypic changes do limit the mating success. This study used house mice as a model species to investigate whether phenotypic variation between wild and captive populations influenced mate choice when the captive population were reintroduced. A captive breeding population was first established from wild caught mice, with the founder group consisting of 11 males and 9 females. Genetic variation was ensured by the use of pedigree mapping and the pairing of founder mice from different capture locations to prevent inbreeding. These individuals were then bred until there was a third generation of captive mice. 54 of these generation captive mice were then released into a semi-natural outdoor enclosures with 54 wild caught mice. To measure phenotypic differences, each individual was caught and weighed weekly and tissue collected from the ears of both adults and resulting offspring to allow for genetic analysis. The captive bred individuals had a significantly larger body mass than the wild mice throughout the duration of the experiment, and genetic analysis showed that the genotypes between the populations also differed, with the captive type showing lower inbreeding coefficient, higher heterozygosity, and lower allelic diversity. But did the mice themselves notice these differences, and were they enough for assortative mate choice to occur? Of the 108 adults released at the beginning of the study, 83% of the resulting litters had a combined parentage of either source type of wild or captive. This suggests that assortative mate type choice did occur within the population. So what does this mean for captive breeding programmes going forward? In this case, the differences in the phenotypes of the two source types were visible to the naked eye with the mass of the mice differing significantly. However, while it is true that the phenotypic differences are the physical expression of genes, they may not always be so obvious to researchers and important factors may be overlooked. For example, were there behavioural differences between the mice? Did their olfactory cues of the wild and captive populations differ as the two populations adapted to specific cues? Further studies using target species would give a clearer idea of the road ahead for individual cases, and if workable solutions are found, 